Well, praise God. I thank God for the technical group that's able to fix those little glitches because I'm not good with handheld mics. Um, name might be Anderson, but I'm half Italian, so the hands fly a lot when I talk. I, I feel very restricted when I, have, when I have something in my hands. But uh, thank you for the welcome. And, you know, as Pastor said, uh, you know, my wife and I, my family have been here for 15 years. So we've been here for a long time, and, and we're just proud to call Cornerstone our home. We love it here, and we love the people here. Uh, you know, Kevin did a great job of talking about that, but, you know, that's what's great about this body is that, you know, we're like one big family. We love each other, and Pastor leads us, and, and the love of God just permeates this place. And uh, I get the opportunity on occasion when Pastor's away. That's why I pray a lot that God would send him away on vacations and give him a time of resting so that I get the opportunity to, to get up and, and preach, because it's one of the things that I love to do the most. And, you know, the message that God gave me, uh, he actually gave me earlier this year, I think it was March, he gave me, you know, the word, and he said, you know, we need to, we really need to have a call to repentance in the church. And, uh, you know, so I've been waiting, and I said, okay, God, just give me the opportunity, and I'll be more than happy to preach that message. I'll be more than happy to get up. And I started looking at, you know, scriptures and things about repentance. And, uh, you know, he's been bir he birthed that then, and he's he developed that message in me up until now. So when Pastor said, you know, hey, do you think you're available? I said, yes, I'm absolutely available, and I'm ready. I already know what I'm going to preach on. I know what the Lord wants me to preach on. And I think, you know, it's, this is a timely message. We're coming into a new year. There's a lot going on in the world. We're coming into a new year uh, pastor talked about the fact that we're going to be having 21 days of fasting. He also has mentioned, he didn't mention it now, but he's mentioned it before, that he's going to be preaching on freedom. And let me tell you, people, uh, repentance is the beginning of real freedom in your life. I mean, re repentance is not just feeling sorry. Repentance is not just, you know, it's like, oh, gee, I hope I never do that again. And, you know, a lot of times that's what we think. And repentance is not a, a word that's used lightly in our culture, used at all in our culture. People today don't want to be accountable to anything. They're never sorry. Why should I be sorry? I'm not sorry I did that. Why should I repent? I'm perfect. There's nothing wrong with me. I don't know if you deal with people in the world. I see people at work when they make mistakes. They're not willing to, make, to be accountable for the mistakes. They're not willing to be accountable for those things. They just want to blame somebody else. Well, it wasn't me. You gave me the wrong instructions. You know, it, it wasn't my fault. It was somebody else's fault. There's no, there's no accountability. And without accountability, there can't come repentance. You know, there's such a, a, a distance between the world and the church, or there should be. But, you know, that same attitude, unfortunately, of the culture has worked its way into the church. There's people that I talk to that are church people that are doing things that I just can't believe that anybody would do, let alone church people. And they don't think it's bad. It's like, well, God understands. God made me. He knows me. He set me up this way. They're not sorry about their behavior. They actually think it's okay. And they're going down a path that's wrong. And they don't see it. They've been blinded by the enemy. You know, when I was young... You couldn't, most of the time, you couldn't tell the difference between church people and world people. And the reason for that was because there was such a godly morality in the world that even people who weren't church people, even people who were not born again Christians, even people who didn't proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord, knew that there were limits on what they could and should do. Certain things that they couldn't watch, certain things that they couldn't say, certain things that they wouldn't do. And you know, unfortunately today I see that a lot of times it's very difficult again to tell the difference between the world and church people. Unfortunately, it's not because the world is so godly and lives a moral life. It's because a lot of times church people are living carnal lives and they come to church and they proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ but they don't ever repent of their sins. They don't ever really want to get right with God. They just, they just come to God and, and you know, they, they come into the body and it's a social club. It's not a commitment. It's not a change of life. 
It's not a change of behavior. And you know, that's, if you think that's sad, how do you think God looks at it? I mean, it's really sad to God when he looks at his body and he sees that there's, sin has permeated the body. Now, I'm looking around and uh, I'm looking at some faces that are saying, oh boy, what are we going through now? Are we going to listen to this for 40 minutes? Well, yeah, you are, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. I've been dealing with this since March. You know, God dealt with me, and he's been dealing with me, and, you know, and he's asked me to bring forth this message, and I've got to do it. I just got to, I've just got to do it. So why is it important that we talk about Repentance. Because if you don't know, the word repent or repentance is used 56 times in the New Testament. It's the focus of Jesus' ministry. You know, we always, you know, we hear about, you know, we'll come to the Lord. And that's extremely important. But, but repentance is tied to salvation, very strongly tied to, to salvation. And it's important, it's an important part of salvation. And it's not just feeling sorry. It's not just feeling bad, because we all have those emotions. Sometimes when we do something wrong, we feel bad about it. We feel sorry about it. But at the same time, we also know that sometimes when somebody does something wrong and they say they're sorry, we know that they don't really mean it. We know that they're sorry that they got caught. I think there's a, there's a great line out of uh, Gone with the Wind where Rhett Butler says to Scarlett after she did something wrong and she's all upset. He looks at her and he says, Scarlett, you're not upset that you did that. You're upset that you got caught doing that. And that's what happens a lot of times. People are not upset that they did something. They're upset that somebody found out that they did something. They're more upset that I don't want anybody to know. But God says that secret sin will be revealed. There will come a time when that secret sin will be revealed. And it's time that we get rid of that. It's time that we move away from that. You know, repentance, I was looking at some things on the internet, and one of the little sayings that I saw that kind of caught my eye was, repentance doesn't mean anything if you keep doing what you're sorry for. So, you know, we've, we've got to understand what repentance really is. And the good news is I'm going to tell you what that is, okay? And I'm going to help you to get to that point. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. It's an interesting word there. We, repentance leads to salvation. When we come to the Lord, repentance leads us to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. The difference, sorrow leads to death. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, which, which leads to true salvation and true power in our lives. The definition that I found that I like says that repentance in Jesus' message is not behavior, but the interchange that gives rise to new God-centered, Christ-exalting behavior. Repentance is an internal change of mind and heart rather than mere sorrow for sin or mere improvement of behavior. You know, a lot of us have come to the Lord and we've cleaned up our act, so to speak, you know, afterwards. We've, we're, we're trying to live a good life. We're trying to do the right things. Repentance helps you to not have to try anymore. It gives you victory over those things in your life. When you truly repent and get on your face before the Lord. You know, I always thought that repentance was, you know, you turn away from your sin. And you turn to God. So you're turning away from the sin, turn to God, and that's repentance and salvation. But repentance is more than just turning away from your sin. You've got to bury that sin. You've got to get on your face before the Lord. That sin that, that, that separated, and sin, people understand, sin is anything that separates you from God. Anything that keeps you from being in lockstep with God is sin. Anything that comes before your walk with the Lord is sin. Anything that separates you and keeps you from doing what God has called you to do is sin. So I'm not talking about adultery. I'm not talking, mean, I am, but I'm not only talking about that. I'm talking about the things that, that keep you from really serving God at the level that God wants you to serve him. 
Because God wants all of you. God wants all, every single part of you. God wants complete surrender of your life before him. He wants to be able to tell you to do something and you say, yes, Lord, and you go and do it. And all too often we say tomorrow. Yes, Lord, but let me just finish that. I mean, how many times when Jesus called somebody, he said, come and follow me. And they said, well, let me go home and bury my father. Now, to me, that seems a little harsh. Okay, you know, and he, what did Jesus say? Let the, bed, let the dead take care of the dead. You come and follow me. What's more important? What are your priorities in life? Where do you want to be in your life? Jesus has a plan for your life. Jesus wants you to serve him completely. He wants to set you free from the, from the things of your past, the sins of your past. You know, sin, I was thinking about this, and I had a visual that, you know, what we do is we come to Jesus, and we've got all this past in this big trunk behind us, and we drag it with us all the time. And we're dragging this trunk because we haven't truly repented of it. We just, we know it's back there, and, you know, we're running away from it, and we're dragging it with this big rope. And, you know, on level ground, which is most of the time, you know, it's a little bit difficult, but we can do it. Then we go through those times in our lives where we're going uphill, and it becomes a real burden. We're struggling with that past. We're struggling trying to bring it with us. And that's difficult as well. But the real problem is when you're going downhill. Because when you're going downhill on that slippery slope, that trunk that's behind you overtakes you and runs you over. And that's when we have the real difficulty with it. And that's when people, you know, just go into depression and they, they fall back into their old ways. They, they just can't get away from it because they haven't truly buried that sin. They haven't truly repented of it. They've come to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm sorry, I don't ever want to do that again. But they don't detest the sin. They don't detest the thing that keeps them from being close to God and serving God. You know, I have an example, and, and, you know, as we were praise and worship, this wasn't in my notes, but, you know, it really came to me. Is, you know, drug abuse is a very difficult thing. And, you know, so many people have struggled with that. They've, for whatever reason, they've got involved in drugs, and they struggle with it. And I have two stories of people who have, who have been involved in drugs. I had one that I knew from, from the church that had a past of drugs and drug abuse, and was using drugs, and he truly repented. He understood, he faced what he was doing as being wrong. He buried that, he repented of it. He hated the fact that at one point in his life he did that, and that it kept him from God. And he wanted to serve God, and he wanted to serve God more than anything in the world. And he truly repented of that, and he buried it, and now he's a pastor, in a church in Brookfield, an Assembly of God church. And he was able to overcome the drug abuse and overcome the drugs and cut that cord and leave it behind and walk forward in the fullness of Jesus Christ because he repented and he buried it. The other story is a little bit more difficult, as you can tell. When I thought of it, I didn't get this emotional, but it was my niece. And... She had the problem, and she hated it. And she came to the Lord, but she never truly repented. She'd be good for a few months. She didn't like it. She wanted to overcome it. She tried to do it in her own strength. She would never completely, 100%, surrender her life to the Lord. She, she said that she wanted to be done with it. And she'd be on that flat ground. She'd be walking, and she'd be carrying it behind her. But, you know, when she was going down that slope, all of a sudden, every few months, it would catch up with her, and she'd disappear for two or three days. And she'd be at some uh, drug house until one day she hung herself because she didn't really repent and give it to the Lord. It's a shame, but that's the difference. I mean, to me, that is the best example that we can have. Somebody who truly repented, hated the sin, never wanted to touch it again, walked away from it, but here's the good thing. You can't do it on your own. When you reach out and you do that, and you reach out and you grab hold of Jesus, then he helps you to overcome. He helps you to stay on that path. He helps you to be an overcomer. We can be overcomers in him, but we have to cut the cord of the past, cut the cord of the old life. 
we have to be, be sold out 100% and surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. Without that, we can't win. We can win for short periods of time, and there are a lot of people in the church that continue to go back and do the same thing. The Bible says, right, that a dog shall return to its vomit and a fool will return to his folly. You know, we have good intentions. It's not in the Bible, but the saying is the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? And it's true. We all have good intentions. But it's time, it's absolutely time for us, for us as the church to repent of our behavior and past. Now, a lot of you might be saying, well, I've repented. I've done, you know, I've, uh, I'm not tied back. I'm not pulling this past behind me. You know, maybe we need to repent. And this is, this is the message to some others, right? Maybe we need to repent of complacency. Maybe we need to repent of disobedience when God has asked you to do something or told you to do something and you said no. And maybe you didn't verbally say no. You just didn't do it. You know, there's, a, there's a, an example in the Bible about two sons. The father says to one, go out and work in the field. And he says no. And he takes off. And he tells the other one, go out and work in the field. And he says, okay, father, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go work in the field. And the two of them go off. The one that says no repented of his action, felt bad about saying no to his father, and went and worked in the field. The other one, who gave lip service to his father and told him, no problem, dad, I'll go work in the field because I'm a good son, went out to the field and kept going and went out and did what he wanted to do. All too often, that's representative of people in the church. You know, God asks you to do something, and you say, God, I'll do anything. We get up in the morning in our morning prayer, God, I'll do anything. Send somebody to me. Send somebody to me that I can, that I can share with them and that I can, you know, bring to you, O oh Lord God. And then we go out, and we get so busy with work and with other things that the opportunities come, and we're not ready. I don't, you know, maybe, maybe this is just me, but, you know, this has happened to me. Where I, you know, I'm always, I always want God to send somebody to me, to give me somebody that I can share the word with, that I can help bring to the Lord. But there are times when I've been so busy doing things and my mind is thinking that somebody comes up and says something and asks me something or something occurs and I respond and walk away and five minutes later, I'm like, you know, what's wrong with you? That was a perfect opportunity. You could have shared with that person. You could have prayed with that person. You should have done more. You shouldn't have just given them some worldly answer to get through it because you're too busy and then just walk away. And then you get convicted by that. Like I said, it's probably only me. Everybody else probably, when those situations arise, more than likely you're ready, you're prayed up, and you're ready to go, and you have the exact right answer to give at that point in time. The Bible says always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. We should always be ready to share. We've always got to be in a position to share the gospel. So this message has two, two sides to it, really. And of course, if you've noticed, I've got all these pages of notes and I haven't looked at any of them yet, but, uh, <laughs> which is typical of me, by the way. Uh, but it's got two messages, really, in it. And the first message is, obviously, we need to cut the cord with the past, the things that are holding us back from serving God, the things in our past. And they could be big sins. They could just be lifely, you know, uh, worldly lifestyles. It could be, you know, all kinds of things that are back there. And it's time to cut that cord. It's time to repent. It's time to bury the past and those things instead of keep looking back. We can't keep looking back because I can tell you, the enemy is a great artist. He will paint the picture of things in your past. The things that were good, he'll paint them to be bad. And the things that were bad, he'll paint them to be good. You know, if you start thinking on those things, you know, he'll be painting pictures in your mind. Oh, remember when you used to go out with the crowd, man? Remember when you used to have all that fun? Remember how much fun that used to be when you used to go hang out with that group that was doing this and this and this? And yeah, boy, don't you miss that. Don't you miss those days? Don't you miss those times? Oh, weren't they so much fun? 
until finally, you know, you start fantasizing in your mind. Because, you know, the Bible tells us in James 1, 15, right, that where does sin start? Sin starts in your mind. First, it's a thought, and then you think on it. You, you, you build it up in your mind. You fantasize about it, and you think, and then it goes into action. And then once it goes into action, it produces death, and then you die, right? I mean, die spiritually, not physically. But, you know, the enemy paints this picture. And I can tell you most of the time, most of the time, if you give in to that and you go, you'll be there and you'll be saying, like, this stinks. I used to do this. I used to like this. I can't stand it. What am I doing here? And hopefully... The Spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit, will bring conviction, and you'll come to your senses, and you'll get up, and you'll go home, and get out of that place, hopefully. But, you know, we keep looking back. We, want it, we, think, it's, we think we can just go back and maybe add a little bit to it. Remember, oh, yeah, remember we used to do that. That was really good. Stay away from those things. Stay, they're traps of the enemy. They're snares of the enemy. He paints that picture, and then he, he causes you to go back. And then once you're there, he'll talk you into doing things that you don't want to do. You know, we used to have a pastor before we came here that said, you know, sin will take you where you don't want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and make you, you do things you don't want to do. And that's exactly what happens. The first step, though, is remember the Bible says that, you know, God will always give you a way of escape. So, you know, you've got, to, you've got to take that way of escape. You've got to bury that, that lifestyle. You've got to get done with that and move forward. Move forward in God. You know, I have a story. Most, or a lot of you, I won't say most because the church keeps growing so much. But, you know, I've had problems with my hands for probably five or six years. Uh, doctor, I've been to the dermatologist twice, you know, twice a year. I get cortisone shots. Uh, my fingers split, the, I get all dry skin, my hands split and bleed, and it's extremely painful, and it's also it doesn't look too nice either when you're shaking hands with people, but that's a secondary issue of it. And a while back, a few weeks ago, probably three little, almost four weeks ago, my daughter was doing, has been doing some research, Jessica Landman's my daughter, by the way, if you don't know, and uh, she was doing some research on the internet. And she called me and she says, you know, gluten can cause that problem. Gluten is tied to psoriasis. And I said, well, the skin doctors did say this is a form of psoriasis. So here's a little medical tip for you, by the way, and this is, you get this for free. If you've got skin issues, try taking gluten out for a while. It might fix it, okay? But so I, I cut gluten out. She said, you know, the picture looks just like your hands. So I cut gluten out for three weeks. And my hands healed. The, the, Cuts disappeared, the, the dryness was gone, my hands were looking great. And it's like, wow. And then Christmas Eve came. And, you know, my wife Louise makes stuffed clams and she makes all these good foods that are just packed with gluten. And I said, well, you know, it's been three weeks. You know, the hands look really good. Maybe it's really not gluten. Maybe it's just coincidence. Maybe I can have a little bit of gluten. Maybe I can go back and, well, on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, special days, of course, I'm going to add gluten back into my diet just to see what happens. Well, I added gluten back into my diet. And I can tell you that my thumbs are swollen, I've got splits on my thumbs, and I can feel my hands starting to dry out and swell up again, and all the symptoms are coming back. But in my mind, I thought maybe I could get away with sneaking a little bit of gluten back into my diet since I'd been so good for three weeks, right? I'd given it up for three weeks. I mean, how much could a little bit hurt? Yeah, I think you know where I might be going with this story, right? You heard the horn, right? You didn't need me, you didn't need me to say anything. But how do we do how many times do we do that? You know, with our, our walk with God. How many times do we just like, well, you know, a little of this, well, how bad can it be? 
maybe if I just watch this now, eh, it's probably a little off color and maybe I shouldn't be, but I'm going to do it. And what if I just go do this? And we start adding things back into our lives because human nature likes to see just how far we can push the envelope, right? You know, human nature wants to see, well, you know, I want to be saved. I, you know, I want to go to heaven. I want to serve God, but maybe I can serve him over here. Oh, seems okay. Let me try it over here. Uh, maybe I don't have to be quite as religious as I thought. Maybe I can go tell some dirty jokes and laugh and do this. Maybe I can. And we start going off, and we want to see how far we can go. The good thing about gluten is within days, within two days, I knew I made a mistake, okay? I knew that I needed, it's all or nothing with gluten, okay? It didn't take long. I found out, bang, just like that. Ate gluten, two days later, I feel the effects of it. So I'm taking gluten out. When we do that, God will allow us to keep going, okay? And we don't really see it. We don't really feel it because we keep slowly Slowly. You know the example of, you know, you throw a frog in a pot of boiling water, he jumps right out. But if you turn the heat up slowly and he's swimming around in there, he never feels the difference in the temperature. And so all of a sudden we start sliding off from where God wants us to be. And, you know, that's, that's where we get into big trouble. Look at Samson. All right, most of you know the story of Samson, the strongest man in the Bible, a judge of Israel. He was, you know, he defeated the, Is the uh, Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. I mean, he was strong. He was powerful. God gave him victory after victory, but he kept pushing the envelope. He kept pushing the envelope. He kept pushing the envelope, and God kept, you know, honoring him, and God kept saying, okay, and, you know, so he was out off to the side. He was out living, doing sinful stuff. He was out with, you know, with the Philistine women. He was out doing partying and all kinds of stuff that he shouldn't have been doing. But he never knew. And the, the scary, one of the scariest vers uh, scriptures in the Bible is that, you know, he woke up because they woke him up and they said, the Philistines are coming. And he got up like he always got up. And it says, and he didn't know that the Spirit of God had departed him. He didn't realize it. He, he had just been compromising and compromising and compromising his life. And he just didn't realize that one day he woke up and it was gone. The power was gone, the strength was gone, the anointing was gone, and he was taken captive by the Philistines. He went out just like he had done the day before, and he got up thinking he was the same man he was before. And he probably got like some of us get, thinking that he was doing this in his own strength. And people, I'm gonna tell you, you can't do, you can't repent in your own strength. You can come to the Lord, and pastor has said, God, God will accept you right where you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. He wants you to keep growing with him. He wants you to keep moving deeper and deeper with him. He wants to see the heart. He wants you to have a heart for him. He doesn't want you to compromise. But you know, the scary thing, like I said, gluten I saw immediately. But when you compromise your life with Jesus and with God, you don't even recognize it. Maybe those around you recognize it and they tell you, but you don't want to hear it because after all, who are you to tell me? I, this is between me and God. Well, is it? It's great if it's between you and God and you're talking to God and you're listening to God and you're getting answers from God and you're doing what God tells you to do. But you know, if we're honest, we know that a lot of times when we say, mind your own business, this is between me and God, you're telling God, hey God, mind your own business, this is about me. And God will not honor that. God cannot honor that. God wants you to be victorious in your life. God wants you to be victorious over your past. God wants you to move forward with him. And I can tell you, in this day and age, there's a lot of stuff that's going on out in this world. We need to be lockstep with God. We need to be absolutely sold out to God. He doesn't want anything but that. He won't accept anything but that. And the key to true repentance and the key to a powerful life of serving God is love. See? You, you have to serve God out of love. That's what repentance is about, that you love God so much 
that he changed you. He reached down. He sent his son. He saved you. And, and you love him so much for that that you never want to be separated. You never want to do anything that would hurt him, that would ever make him turn his face from you, that you, that you, always, want, you always want to have God look down and say, there's my child. Look at, look at my, my son. Look at my, my child, my servant, Cliff. Well done, my true and faithful servant. We want him to always be, be feeling good about what we're doing, and it, we have to serve him out of love. People have tried to serve God out of a lot of reasons. You know, people come to God for a lot of reasons, but ultimately, it has to turn to love. It has to turn to love and repentance. If it doesn't, then you're going you're gonna to miss it. I've known somebody who tried to serve God out of fear. Now, a reverent fear of God is good. We should have a reverent fear of God. But the person I'm talking about, and my wife will know who I mean, but this person knew the scriptures as good as anybody I've ever met. He could recite scriptures. He, he knew them. He could twist them, turn them, to make them say whatever he wanted them to say. And he served God, and, and you'd, have a, you'd have a discussion with him, and he'd say, oh, yeah, I'm serving God because I don't want to go to hell. I've read what the Scripture says about hell. I'm afraid of hell. I'm afraid to go into hell, so I'm going to serve God. Well, that was, he served God out of fear, and he continually backslided. It was always backsliding because you can't, it, fear is not a good motivator to change behavior. It changes it for a little while. But then we all think we're smart enough that we can get away with it. We think, as Samson did, that we can continue to get away with it. So, you know, he would serve him for a while, but it was always, yeah, well, I got to do this because, you know, if I don't, you know, I don't want to go to hell. I want to be right. You know, I want to be right. I don't, I don't want to. And then he'd do something. He'd backslide. The true way that glues you to God and to his, and to his purposes in your life is love. When you don't do things because you love God so much that you don't want to hurt him, that you don't want, you know, when I was young, I could have done a lot of things, you know, it's a whole different story, but, you know, I didn't have a lot of supervision when I was young in my house, okay, and uh, so I could have done a lot of things. Uh, I came and went as I pleased, I, I did a lot of things that I'm not proud of, and that I've repented of, by the way, and I've buried, but... There was always that part of me that says, no, I'm only going to, you can only go so far because I don't want to hurt my mother. I don't want to hurt my parents. You know, you, you get to that point where if there's love, it keeps you from doing things. Love is what keeps you from sinning. Love is what keeps you from doing things. You know, when you're by yourself, you could do a lot of things and nobody, nobody will know. What's the love of God, the love of family, the love, the love that God has shown you and the love you have for him that you want to serve him. You want to serve him when you're in the crowd. You want to serve him when you're in the church. You want to serve him when you're in the workplace. You want to serve him when you're all alone. You want to serve God. That's the kind of repentance that we're talking about. And that's what's important to God, a true and cont contrite heart. God says that he's looking for a people with pure hearts and clean hands. And it all starts with the heart. True repentance starts from the heart. I had a lot of scriptures. You can look them up yourself. There's 56 in the, in the, in the New Testament that talk about repentance. I, I do want to say one, though. I do, because the first one, and I think this is important, because I said that Jesus' ministry started and was focused on repentance. After Jesus was baptized, now, John, you know that John's whole ministry it was ushering the way for Jesus, and he preached repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He baptized Jesus. Jesus went into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, was tempted by the, de by the devil. He overcame the devil, and that's when his ministry started. He came out of the desert, and Jesus' first words after he came out of the desert in Matthew 4, 17, and the, and the scripture says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The very first words that Jesus spoke when he came out of the desert was repent. And there's scripture after scripture 
where Jesus talks about repentance. Repentance is tied to salvation, people. You know, we've come to know the Lord, and I'm sure if you're here, you've come, because, you know, you've come to know the Lord and you've accepted Jesus Christ. But if you're dragging that weight around from the past, if you're dragging things around that you don't want to drag around anymore, if you want to, if you want to be free from that and have true freedom, and you want to go into the new year serving God and on fire for God and forgetting about the things of the past, God says, you know, forget the former things, the things of the past, because I'm doing a new thing in you. Can you not perceive it? Well, it's time for us to perceive that God is doing a new thing in us, and we can forget about the things of the past. We can bury them. God has buried them in the sea of forgetfulness, by the way. It's, it's us who keeps dragging them around and keeps tripping over them. You know, I heard a story uh, once that somebody said that they were praying, and they went to God, and they said, <laughs> sorry about that, and they, and they said to God, you know, God, it's me. I've done it again. You know, they kept tripping over that same thing. And he says, you know, God, it's me. I, I've done it again. I'm sorry. You know, I keep stumbling over that. And God looked at him and says, what do you mean you've done it again? I see no record of you ever doing this before. Because God forgives when we repent, when we ask for forgiveness. It says he's faithful and just to forgive us. So he does do that. It's us who needs to cut, repent, bury that behind us, you know, and not carry it with us anymore. You know, I've, I've, I've had times in my life, and, and this is, I want to encourage you with this. I've had times in my life when I've been so in lockstep with Jesus that him and I, you know, we were talking constantly. And I was walking in power. I was walking in strength. I felt it. I knew it. Not my own strength in his strength. And when I walked into a room, the environment in that room changed. Not because of me, because of who I brought with me. I brought Jesus with me. I brought the Holy Spirit with me. And that room changed because I was there. And some people were made to feel uncomfortable because I was there. They didn't want me there. It was either me or them. And they left. You know, we were in Hawaii once and we walked into a mall and, you know, Louise and I were like, something doesn't feel right, huh? Something's uncomfortable in here. And, and, you know, we're looking all around, right? Because we're like, something's going on. What's happening here? You know, we just felt this oppression and this heaviness in the spirit. And the kids were with us. They were much younger. And, you know, all of a sudden there was this kiosk in the middle of the mall. And there was somebody in there reading tarot cards and, and doing all kinds of, you know, demonic things in there. And, you know, we're looking around and all of a sudden it's like, boom, our eyes locked on that kiosk. And you know what? The person who was working in that kiosk was looking around too. They were looking around too because they were sitting there doing what they did every day. But all of a sudden they're like, ooh. Something's not right here. I feel like my power is getting a little weak. I feel like something's happening. I'm feeling oppression because, you know, our presence made them feel uncomfortable. Our presence, they, and our eyes met and we looked at each other and we knew them and they knew us. But that's what we're supposed to walk in. That's the kind of strength that we're supposed to walk in. That's the kind of victory. And then when somebody comes to you and says, hey, you know, I got this issue in my life, you know, bang, you're ready. You're ready to pray for him. You're ready to give him a word. You're ready to tell him. I mean, there's been times when we've been walking around and, you know, all of a sudden God gives me a word. Go up to that person. I don't know that person. Go up to that person and tell them this. And you go up to that person and you tell them that and that person says, thank you. Thank you. You know, that's right on. I don't know. Where, where did you, how did you know that? I didn't. He did. That's what we want. There's nothing, I can tell you, there's nothing more exciting than that, okay? There is absolutely no better time than to be in the presence of God and working and doing God's work in the midst of his people. You can't, it doesn't get better than that. I don't care what kind of party you're talking about or anything else. That is it. Now, I'm sad to say there's also been times when I've gotten so busy with work and with other things that, you know, it's like, okay, God, yeah, I'll catch up with you later. You know, oh yeah, well, okay, the Bible, I don't have really time for it today. I'm looking like, I got to get to work. I got to do this. I got to do that. And, you know, the weakness, you can feel the drain 
out of your body. You can feel that the spirit is just not strong. Lionel Richie sings a song, right, that always touched me. It says, I miss my time with you. And, you know, it's, that's God saying, you know, here I was still waiting, and you walked right by. How are you going to serve me if your spirit's empty? And, you know, we need to do that. I, I've seen both sides. And you know what, people? I'm going to tell you, this message really put me on base. And it says, repent of those times of, you know, again, repent of the times of complacency. Repent of those times when you haven't been obedient. Repent of those times when you got a little lazy with the Lord and you put him aside, figuring I'll catch up with you tomorrow. You know, God wants all of us. He wants 100% of us, 110% of us. And you know the good news is, if we give him 100%, he gives back, oh, more than abundantly. Right? You know, the enemy says, right, in John 10.10, 10, it says that the thief comes for to kill, to steal, and destroy. And it says, but I came. Jesus says, but I came that I may give you life and give it more abundantly. God wants us to have an abundant life. God wants us to walk in strength and in victory and in power. And most importantly, we can never forget that God wants us to walk with the great commission before us. Go ye therefore into all the world, pro proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our mission is not to feel good. Even though God lets us feel good, God helps us to feel good. Our mission is to go out and do the work of our Father, do the work that he sent us to do. God says he honors obedience even over sacrifice. So sacrifice means nothing to God. Obedience means everything. And today I'm telling you, he's telling you, repent of your slackness, repent of your complacency, repent of your, of your not doing what you're supposed to be doing and what I've told you to do, and repent of not being the soldiers that I've called you to be in the kingdom of God and walk in strength and victory and power and might from this day forward. People, we've got a nation that's fallen apart We've got a nation that needs Jesus Christ. God says what? He says in Chronicles 7, 21, he says, if my people, that's us people, God's people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Hmm. God's people have to turn from their wicked ways. We have to turn from our wicked ways. He says, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal your land. That's what we need, people. We need to repent of laziness. Let's call it what it is. Laziness and self selfness. And make it all about him. Praise you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for this message, O oh Lord God. Father, I pray that this word would go out and not only touch hearts, but change hearts today, O oh Lord God. Let us realize how important it is that, Father, we serve you, Lord God, that we surrender it all to you, that we give it all to you, O oh Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that every person here would understand the freedom that they have through repentance and through Jesus Christ and serving you, that their past doesn't have to overtake them anymore, that they can be, they can be free for whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And let us use that freedom to serve you, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, I'm going to pray because, you know, there, I don't know where anybody in this place is, but if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's the first step. You accept him. You come to him. You recognize that you're a sinner. You recognize that you need to repent. And then he will come into your life and he will give you such power, such strength, and such joy that you just can't imagine. So I'm going to say a prayer now. And I, I would ask that everybody would bow their heads and close their eyes. And I'm going to give you an opportunity that if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you can do that right now. And you can walk from this place a new person. You can cut that cord with your past and walk in strength and victory and power. So just repeat, repeat this after me, and I'd ask that the whole church would repeat it. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but uh, it's critical that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. That's the first step always. And if you've, and if you've backslid, 
or if you've served him for the wrong reasons, now's the time to recommit. So pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I come before you today a sinner. Father, I haven't done what you've asked me to do, but I know that Jesus Christ, my Lord, my Savior, died on the cross for me, for my sins. And through him, I can have complete victory and salvation. So I lay my sins down at the cross. I lay my past down at the cross. And I ask Jesus to come into my heart. I ask Jesus to take over my life. I surrender my will to Jesus this day. And I ask that the Holy Spirit would work in me to lead me to the peace and the joy and the love of Jesus Christ. I commit to serve you all the days of my life in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer today, I'd ask that maybe you'd raise your hand. Let me see if you did. I could pray for you. I'm not going to ask you to come up and say a speech or anything, but it's important. It's an important step for us to move forward in victory and in power and in might. Okay, praise God. The altars are open. And, you know, I, I really feel that if you've struggled with some of these things, if you've been complacent, if you haven't really been where God wants you to be, now is the time. I'd ask the prayer team to come up, and, and now is the time to come and just lay it all down before the Lord. Lay it down before Him. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Praise you, God. I've been set free by God my Savior has ransomed me like a flower. there's anybody who has any needs too, I mean, it's, the altars are open not only for that. If, you, if you're sick, if you have any needs in your life, then there's no better place than to come to the altar and have somebody pray with you. Uh, it's just agreeing before the Lord. So just wanted you to know that it's not just for repentance, it's also for any needs. So come forward. <laughs> 